So good evening, everyone. Today's topic is Game Changers. That's Jack Inhibitors for Alopecia areata. So I've been hearing a lot about Jack kinase inhibitors in the last few months and years. So I thought I should look into this particular molecule in a bit more detail, particularly in alopecia areata, because my knowledge of the basic sciences was quite poor, particularly for this particular new agent. So what I'll be trying to do in the next 10 to 15 minutes is explain to you how jack kinase inhibitors work and how the alopecia areata pathogenesis is actually unique and therefore jack inhibitors play a specific role in trying to control this condition. So I've called it a game changer because till now we don't have that great a treatment for alopecia areata. We can control it. We can use various oral and topical agents, but none have been as effective as jack inhibitors. So to continue with our theme, just like Shubman Gill has been a game changer in the IPL, I guess our new molecule is going to be a game changer for us. So I'll be splitting my talk into three parts. Let's look at the pathogenesis of alopecia areata first. Then we look at the mechanism of action of jack inhibitors. And then finally, look specifically of the practicalities. How do we use it? What dose do we use? What side effects there are? Because this is what we will need to know as practicing physicians. Let's look at the pathogenesis of alopecia areata first. It's quite a unique uh, type of pathogenesis. We all know it's autoimmune. So it's our own immune system attacking our own hair follicles but there are some specificities in it which we need to understand first. There are other possible etiological factors too. There is a genetic factor. So if you look at alopecia areata, generally there will be a family history in a majority of those who've had it, meaning more than 50%. Autoimmunity, we already know. There are these autoantibodies, particularly T lymphocytes against the hair follicles. And there are environmental factors too, things like stress, viruses, certain medications that can trigger it off. But what we need to know specifically is this immune privilege. So there are immune privilege areas in the body of which hairs and skin are part of it. That's the reason why we have no immunity against normal hair and normal skin. And the reason that occurs is because of two factors. One is there is a very low MHC expression. Um, there's a very low MHC expression, which is major histocompatibility complex expression. And there are suppressed natural cells, natural killer cells. And I'll show it to you in the next slide. We need immune privilege. We need our immune system to protect us from infection and cancers, but we don't want our immune system to attack our own cells. So that's why immune privilege is so important. It maintains normal tissue function, but it also prevents external things and cancers from occurring. So let's look at what happens in immune privilege. Now, if you look in the left, where there's healthy hair follicles, you can see that there is decreased MHC expression below the isthmus. And if you look at the cytokines, there is no immune cells there. There's no CD lymphocytes, no CD8 lymphocytes. And there's increase in interleukin-10. And I'll tell you the significance of this later on. In interleukin-10 actually is a protective interleukin. It makes sure that there is no autoimmunity. So it is actually quite important. But see what happens in alopecia areata on the right. Firstly, there's increased MHC expression, which means there are more T lymphocytes coming into the hair follicles. So if you look on the right, you can see not increased natural killer cells, and that damages the follicular epithelium, and there's plenty of T cell infiltration there. So this is typically what happens in alopecia areata. On the left-hand side, you can see a normal antigen half follicle. And on the right hand side, this is what we see as the swarm of bees appearance. So what is the swarm of bee appearance? It is full of T lymphocytes, dendritic cells, plasma cells, and mast cells. And all of these are activated because the immune privileges come down. And because the immune privileges come down, 
increased activation and therefore autoantibodies are formed. Now that we know roughly what's going on in the hair follicles, let's look at how JAK inhibitors work because there is an interaction between these two. What first is JAK, uh, JAK inhibitors? You actually have to call it the JAK STAT pathway. It's not just the JAK, it's the STAT molecule with it and they're all proteins sitting on the cell receptors. What they do is they form a communication between the outside of the cell and the cell nucleus. And this communication involves Janus kinase, which is JAK, and STAT, which is signal transdu transducer and activation of transcriptase proteins. And I'll sh show you these uh, in an image. If you look at this image, the pink is the receptor. And along with the receptor, you have the JAK kinase. And attached to the JAK kinase, you have the STAT protein. In normal cells, this is what happens. There is something from outside the cells, which are called ligands, and they can be viruses, interleukins, whatever. They come and attach themselves to the receptor. They then activate the JAK molecule that phosphorylates. That then activates the STAT molecule, which phosphorylates. That comes to the nucleus, and then the nucleus produces proteins, which gives signals to the cells as to what to do next. So this is normal. Now this is what happens in JAK kinase inhibitors if you use them. On the left, you can see the normal pathway. And remember, this pathway is overexpressed in alopecia areata. That's the problem. So on the right hand side, you can see that the JAK in molecule actually binds with the receptors and prevents the STAT molecules from being phosphorylated. It therefore prevents all the inflammatory cascade below that. So you may wonder how this is related to the hair follicle. So let's look at the next slide. But before that, I'll have to tell you where each receptor is. There are four receptors. There's JAK1, 2, 3 and there's something called TIC2, tyrosine kinase 2 receptors. All of them are important. If you look at JAK1, they're mostly in inflammatory disorders, so rheumatoid arthritis, maybe even a bit of psoriasis. JAK2 is mostly for hematopoiesis, so all the myeloproliferative disorders. JAK3 is mainly the lymphoid lineage, and then the TIC2, it can be associated with many of these other functions. The reason you need to know this is Depending on which JAK kinase you use, the side effect profile will actually be understood. For example, if you have a JAK2 inhibitor, you will get neutropenia because it's going to attack the hematopoietic cells. If you have a JAK1 inhibitor, it's going to be a very broad range of anti-inflammatory cells. So what we want with alopecia areata is probably JAK3 inhibitors because they are more specific lymphoid cells and that's the cell we saw in the hair follicle. That's theory though. In practice, if you look at it, most of them are a combination of all of it. It's not just JAK3, it'll be JAK1, JAK2, JAK3, even TIC2 inhibitors. So knowing this is important because you may know what the side effect profile is, but using this to actually target which JAK inhibitor you want probably isn't, it's more an academic exercise. So this is what happens at the level of the hair follicle. Now if you look at it on the right hand side, at the bottom you have the T lymphocyte and at the top you have the follicular epithelial cell. Normally in alopecia areata, all of these are overexpressed. Because it's overexpressed, you can see that the nucleus starts producing loads of interferons, particularly interlo interleukin 15. When that interleukin 15 goes back to the T lymphocyte, it makes it produce even more cells. So it's a vicious cycle. It produces more and more inflammatory cells. And what we want to do is block this. And that's why these JAK inhibitors come in. So if you look down there, JAK1 and JAK3 is what's found in the T lymphocyte. So you have tofacitinib, which blocks JAK1 and JAK3, and you have ruxolotinib and baricitinib, which blocks JAK1. And then if you go to the follicular epithelial cell, you have JAK1 and JAK2, and that's where baricitinib, rixloxinib, and tofacitinib works. 
So if you know roughly what's happening at the level of the hair follicle, you can understand how these jack inhibitors work. So let's look at next the practicalities of which jack inhibitors are used, what the dosage is and what the side effect is. The one which has the most evidence is baricitinib. They've done the biggest study, it's called the BRAVE study, nearly 1,200 patients. Ruxolitinib is probably the next kid new one in the block, but tofacitinib is the one which we have most experience with. So we'll look at these three in more detail. Tofacitinib, as I said, it's the oldest one, first reported in 2014, and remember, most of the jacks were actually used for something else. Here, for example, they were using it for psoriasis, but they found that it actually worked for alopecia areata as well. And this works against JAK1 and JAK3. And the largest series was 90 patients and fairly good results. About 65 responded, so about a 75% response rate, of which 13 were full responders, which means they had complete hair growth, and 37 were intermediate hair responders, which means they responded about 50% of hair growth. Baricitinib inhibits 1 and 2, JAK1 and 2, first reported in 2015. And this is the only one which has two RCTs, both published just last year in the New England Journal of, Journal of Medicine. Huge studies. One JAK, uh, uh, BRAVE 1, BRAVE AA1 was nearly 650 patients, and BRAVE AA2 was 540 patients. So more than 1,200 patients. But if you look at the final result, it's about a 40% improvement. So it's not as great as, you know, our anti psoriasis treatment. So it's reasonably good, but the SALT score is very good, 80% improvement of, uh, of the each person. And this is the BRAVE 1 and 2 studies, and you can see on the left-hand side that this is the proportion of patients who have a SALT score of less than 20, which means they had 80% regrowth. And if you look at baricitinib at four milligrams, about 41% responded. If you have the two milligrams, it's only about 21%. With the BRAVE 2 study as well, you can see that about 36% responded. You have to wait for quite a long time. If you look at the study, they did it for 36 weeks, but it continued to improve even after that. So up to a year, you may have to wait before you have an improvement. Ruxolitinib is another new agent which has come on. This is a JAK1 and JAK2 inhibitor, and it has some effect on TIC2 as well, which is the fourth, in, fourth receptor. Quite a small study, only 12 patients, but nine responded, and very impressive, 92% regrowth of all hairs. The newer agents also have excellent evidence. This is a new study, Allegro study, and they use two receptors, two JAK inhibitors, Ritlinisib, which is a JAK3 inhibitor, and Brepronisitib, which is JAK1 and TIC2 inhibitors. So let's look at the study. This was an uh, American Academy of Dermatology publication. And if you look at the SALT score again, if you want a 90% improvement with both drugs, it was about 25 to 35%. But if you look at only a 30% improvement, then you get closer to 50 to 65 percent. So you do get improvement, but only a mild improvement in a majority. If you want that full hair growth, you're probably going to get it only in about 30 percent, maximum 40 percent of patients. And this is even with the latest JAK inhibitors. What investigations do we do? Uh, the usual ones, full blood count using these kidney tests, and Remember, if you know that they are a JAK2 inhibitor, you have to be more careful looking at the full blood count because neutropenia is very possible there. You have to do a viral hepatitis screen because all of these can result in increase in chance of infection. TB screen is also quite important and we do it in the UK as well before we start it. And it can increase LDL cholesterol. So you have to do a lipid profile before starting. Dosage wise, each uh, JAK inhibitor is slightly different. Tofacitinib is between 10 and 20 milligrams. The study they did with baricitinib was 2 milligrams and 4 milligrams, but most 
effective was with the 4 milligram dose. And then ruxolatinib has been used at 20 milligrams twice a day. With the newer agent, repositinib was 60 milligrams for 4 weeks and then 30 milligrams for 20 weeks. So you can see that all of them are used for at least 6 months. And then finally, Ritalin is at 200 milligrams for 4 weeks and then 50 milligrams for another 20 weeks. If you look at all studies, generally they use it for at least 6 months. And if they're changing the dosage, they change the dose after a minimum of four months. So if you're starting, for example, baricetinib at two milligrams, you use it for at least four to six months, and then you go to four milligrams, another four to six months. So you take one year to exhaust one drug if you want to use it properly. So really, really long periods of time. And remember, even after this one year, only 30 to 40 percent will have a 90 percent improvement. All the others will have a 50% improvement, but not a 100% improvement. So you have to be a bit realistic even with our patients. One thing we shouldn't tell them is, oh, don't worry, you'll get all your hair back. It's probably not going to happen. They will get a majority of their hair back, but that's not going to be the same as complete regrowth. Quite a lot of minor side effects. You know, you can get abdominal symptoms. But by far, that's the commonest, a bit of nausea, tummy upset. Uh, there is an increase of urinary tract infection and respiratory tract infections as well. So you do have to warn patients. Probably they do have to take more care, maybe wear masks and other things if they're going to high-risk areas. There is this new uh, evidence that it causes folliculitis and acne. In fact, when, we went to, when I went to the American Academy recently, they call it jacne. It's not acne, it's jacne because it's so common to get folliculitis and acne with that, uh, with jack inhibitors. And then the uh, raised LDL cholesterol we've already uh, uh, discussed about. That's why we have to baseline lipids and repeat it every four months. Some slightly more serious side effects, zoster recurrence does occur. So in some institutions, particularly if they're going to, they know they're going to use the jack inhibitor for quite prolonged periods, they actually give them the zoster vaccine before they start. They just give them the zoster vaccine. DVTs, thrombosis seems to be commoner too. And then TB reactivation, that's probably something which in India is going to be quite tricky. You have to be quite careful to screen people. And then liver damage as well. These are rare, but they are serious side effects. And most recently, there was this warning, which came uh, as it's like a black box warning. And the study they used is they compared the side effects of TNF antagonists and JAK inhibitors. And what they found was that if you compare the two major groups, TNF antagonists and JAK inhibitors, you are 1.6 times more likely to get a major adverse cardiovascular event. So this is not against baseline, it's against a TNF antagonist. Similarly, malignancy was 1.3 times more likely to happen if you use it again, comparing it to a TNF antagonist. These absolute numbers are still very low, so I wouldn't be too worried about it yet. We don't have long-term data from dermatological literature, but it doesn't look frightening enough to not give it to our patients because if you look at it, TNF antagonists have been there for 20 years and there's still no major risks about cancers and major adverse cardiovascular events yet. So if you compare with TNF antagonists, it's slightly higher. But then TNF antagonists itself don't cause it that commonly. So overall, you have to be aware of it, but it's not that worrying that we don't give it to our patients. Just a word of caution, I told you about that interleukin-10, which is then healthy people. In fact, it's one of the interleukins which protects us and keeps immune privilege. The problem with JAK inhibitors is it inhibits interleukin-10 as well. So this article, which was published in The Lancet, tells us to be careful what could happen to the hair follicles if you actually take away interleukin-10 it may actually make the autoimmune process worse. So in effect, if you start using JAK inhibitors for alopecia areata, you probably have to carry on for life 
because this is going to be inhibited too. So therefore, this immunological phenomenon is going to get worse and worse and worse. So you, you really can't stop using a JAK inhibitor. So this is a word of caution in that Lancet article. So the take home points which I want to convey really are that JAK inhibitors are effective, they do work, but probably be a bit realistic in how effective they are. It's not like psoriasis where we have excellent drugs, we can tell our patient, yeah, I can clear you. We can't quite say that with alopecia areata yet with JAK inhibitors. We can give them most of their hair back, but not all their hair. The response rate, as I said, is if you look at average, it's about 60%. And this is only more than 50% regrowth, not 100%. Knowing the potential side effects is quite helpful to make a good risk-benefit ratio. So as long as we explain to our patients, these are the risks. If you want me to give it to you, I will. But look out for these pot pot potential side effects. And as long as you have no problems, we can try it and give it a go. And you have to use it for a period of at least 6 to 12 months. And I'm sure patients will be bringing you, many patients bring paper cuttings like this, you know, New York Times telling how wonderful this drug is. So hopefully next time the patients bring this to you, we'll have a rough idea, idea of how exactly jack inhibitors work and what we can tell our patients. Thank you. Mm.